Which is priceless. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Major Shane will be right back in. She's just going to grab a, I don't know, a pen or something. Um, hey, everybody. We're in Genesis 32 tonight, uh, and we're I think we're already online. So joining us is Aaron. Hello. Jacob. Hey. Darren. Hi. Kiara. Hello. Rebby. Hi. Major Martin, that's me. And then Major Shannon. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> uh, she'll be right back. And I know Henry's coming too because I already talked to him and I see him getting out of his car. That's probably him, right? Yep, sure is. So Henry will be here in a second too. Um, well, we're on chapter 32, so we're going to say a word of prayer and then we'll dig in. Anyone like to pray for our Bible study tonight? I can. Go ahead. Father in heaven, thank you for this place where we can come and fellowship and for your word. We pray that you would open your word and send your Holy Spirit to make it alive in our lives so we can apply your word to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And uh, I don't know who's online or if anybody is. But no major shin will be watching that. As always, we'll do prayer requests at the end. Um, so if you have any you want to share, um, you can put them in the comments or send a note to the message it to Major Shannon there, and she'll read it uh, when we get to that part. But does anybody want to catch us up on where we're at coming into Genesis 32? Do you remember the excitement of Genesis 31 last time? Jacob. The, where Laban came and searched his camp to try and find who stole the idols and uh, then they were going to go and meet Esau and I'm not sure where 31 ended and 32 started because I read 31 so that I could kind of get the, the picture before I went to 32 so I read both chapters Ooh, you read both chapters. There's an overachiever. Awesome, I love it. Uh, <laughs> it's audio Bible, so all I gotta do is sit down with my supper and push the play button. Yeah, remember Laban chased Jacob, remember? And then Laban had his own little vision and dream of God. Uh, said, hey, don't mess, with, don't mess with my boy. Hey guys, do you need to come through this way? A missing mask. Yes. Because we imported the mask rule in the youth center. Do you remember where you were sitting? Yes. I don't see it. I think it probably got thrown away. I don't know. You know that thing is going on to the office? Yes. Just 
piles and piles of them. Okay, we'll just go grab them. Thank All right. you. Sorry, turn around. You're oh, fine. Oh, Jacob, yeah. will you go into Major Shannon's office and there's a whole pile of them sitting on sure. there? Let's just grab a box and give it to Sherry, will you? Okay, because there's no one. Can you bring uh, she's one in there now. Okay. So Can should you be bring open. me one? I forgot mine at home. Sure. Oh, she's coming out. Yeah, hey. Yeah. Whoa, whoa. They made a deal, they did some dealing. They, yeah, they made a deal last time with Jacob you and I, are, you that they would, like, under God, they had, like, this deal where they said, okay, God, you have to keep us both accountable, regardless of where we are, we can't be, you know, messing with each other, because you'll know, and uh, then we'll be, I don't know, smoke. Right, they made this covenant. Uh, the Mizpah, remember, may the Lord wash between me and thee while we are absent from one another. I won't cross this line. Not that I will never cross this line into your territory. No, I'll never cross this line to do you harm. Right? Yeah. That was that was last time. Good. Right. Um, and uh, Laban wakes up in the morning, kisses his, all of his kids and uh, great grandkids or whatever, and hits the road. Right? So Jacob is still on his way to, uh, uh, well, back to his back to his actual land, actually back to the land of promise. We pick up here in chapter 32 with a very odd portion of scripture, um, which is sort of tucked away in here right at the beginning. In verse 1, that's all right, uh, verse 1, now as Jacob went on his way, the angels of God met him. And Jacob, Sorry. Jacob said when he saw them, this is God's camp. So he named that place Mahaniah. And then the scripture picks up like as if nothing just happened. <laughs> what do you have to say about those first two verses? Weird, right? Yeah. Did you bring me a mask, Major Shannon? No, I didn't know you needed one. Did you come in to get rid of your mask? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't grab another one. She gave me a container full, like a plastic piece of plastic. Okay. Ruby, do you want a um, cupcake? No, thanks. I already had ice cream. Thank you. Do you want one? Uh, no, I better not. So, does someone want to try to explain what's happening in those first couple verses? The first two verses here? Yeah. Um, so... So like that, it seems like the, Jacob is saying like this is like God's territory. Like this is his because he says it named he named that place Men Men Mahanaim. So like is he like claiming the territory for like God? I don't know. I suppose that's one way of interpreting it. Um... When you think about the angels of God, and really our Catholic brothers and sisters have a lot more, um, well, lore isn't the right word, a lot more to say about angels than we do um, as salvationists, but we don't deny the presence of angels, but in general the understanding is that angels are all around uh, in this, the spiritual beings, and that they, uh, we just don't see them. They're working and serving, and um, if you think of uh, if you think of like the host of angels, um, the the host of angels that was it Elisha um, saw suddenly the, the great host of angels around, and then he then he knew like the battle was okay, like look look up to the hills and like oh my gosh, all these angels are here to help. Um, I actually know I just. I was reading about this part, and I suppose it's not right for me to share someone else's story, but it's really interesting. So I'm going to share it anyway. It's one from one of the commentaries. Um, someone shared about a missionary in a particular location, had been working for years, and the local peep, the local people, had risen up to kill and surround their their little hut and and to, to murder them. And they had like commandeered like a whole army of people to attack and kill them. Um, 
And but you know they they were kind of helpless. So they just sort of hid in their place and prayed all night long. And then um, and the, ever and they all went away. They didn't actually attack. And then later, years later, the chief of that area became a Christian, uh, got saved, and then came back and said. Then they were having this conversation. It's like, hey, do you remember that one time when? Uh, when uh, when you were gonna attack and kill us, you know, with your whole army of people and stuff. And he said, "Well, right. I've been meaning to ask you, where where did all those soldiers come from?" And he said, "What soldiers? We saw we saw bright lights. We saw people swinging swords and standing guard and bright armor uh, everywhere. So we turned back. So um, this isn't like the weirdest thing to see angels." Um, but it's not very common, obviously. So to me, that's my interpretation of this is suddenly Jacob was able to see these angels of God. And he saw them and said, oh, and he says, oh, this is God's camp. And he just called that place where he saw them, uh, Mahaniah. So that's kind of my interpretation of that is that he was just able to see them. Now, a good question would be, if that's right, is why? Why then? The other question is, how did he know they were angels? You know? Maybe it's one of those things like that, like, you don't know what an angel would look like, but, like, you'll know when you see one. Like, you don't know, but then when you see it, you're like, well, obviously that's an angel. <laughs> right. That's believable. Uh, that answers Henry's question to me. Yeah. I, I feel like, <laughs> but I, you're, you're like, right, Henry. Like, God reveals it to you. Mm -hmm. And another good thing, like, think about, so Jacob has just made peace with Laban. Remember, Jacob's whole life has been about sort of unrest, right, and deception, and, uh, and all kinds of things. Suddenly, he's made peace with his, his crooked father-in-law, right, the car salesman. Um, and if he was questioning God's will for him, remember... He finally got this direct direction from the Lord to go back home, right? That finally happened. And so something else besides his Bethel moment. God is in this whole, this whole chapter. It's pretty exciting. And then on his way here, he's just had this thing. Suddenly the angels of God, he gets to see them and, and presumably meet with them. But we don't have any record of any interaction here. We just know that they saw them, right? Anyway, it's interesting because... It sort of caps off what is important about this chapter, I think. It sort of puts bookends. I mean, I know the chapters are a little arbitrary, but around this part of the story, it's very unique. I have almost I forgot. I Until we, I read this again, I had forgotten this even existed. Um, which brings to mind to think, like, how often does God allow us to see things that were maybe always there that we'd never seen before? Um, I think it's a commentary on our own life in a, in a way. It happens to me all the time. <laughs> I'll read something that I've, you know, listened to a scripture or read a scripture that I read all my life, like the Christmas story. And a few years ago when I was teaching Sunday school, I read the Christmas story. And I figured, do I want to strain my eyes and read that or not? And I said, well, I do because I want to have it fresh in my mind. And a, and a verse popped out at me that I had read several times and heard many, many more. And all of a sudden, the, the meaning of that verse was like a, a revelation. Mm -hmm. And I went in and told Harold, and he says, uh-huh, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Harold. <laughs> Funny. All right, well, let's pick back up with verse 3. It's sort of like, again, that was like its own separate commentary on those first couple verses. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And I don't mean to pause, but I want us all to notice in this sudden separation that we had the last couple chapters... It's only been the last few chapters where 
if it remember if it wasn't clear that Jacob is where the promise is going to go, where is Esau? He is in the land of Edom, right? He is in a different land. He is not this his separation uh, that we had with him and his birthright and the blessing. Here it's again. He he is with living with his family somewhere else. Okay. In verse 4, Jacob, he also commanded them, saying, Thus shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen and donkeys and flocks and male and female servants, and I have sent to tell my lord that I may find favor in your sight. So Jacob is suddenly, he reconciled with Laban, and then he's coming back home, and even though his brother isn't right there where he would be at, he sends messengers to his brother. How do you feel about this message? What do you think this is all about? I think he was afraid of what he was going to find. Afraid of what he was going to find? Yeah, Esau might come to visit him with some swords. So basically, hey, tell them I've got lots, lots of possession. I've got lots of servants and donkeys, and I'm, I'm coming back. And are we okay? Right? Are, are we good? But I also think it's interesting that he calls him Lord. He's being subservient to his brother. That's the word I was going to say. Yeah. Um, suddenly. The Jacob that's 20 years older is a lot more humble than the one that was fine stealing his brother's blessing, right? Suddenly, suddenly he's showing a, a lot of respect here for his brother. Maybe repentance, too. I'd like to think so. I hope everybody heard that Remy said maybe repentance also. Which is interesting from a theological standpoint when you consider the whole chapter in context, too. That in the midst of his reconciling with family, he is also, in a sense, getting a reconciliation with the Lord in this chapter, which is pretty profound. But sorry, that might be overthinking a little bit, um, but I feel like we're heading that direction. And the messengers respond, verse 6, the messengers return to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau, and furthermore... He is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. That'd be enough to scare me back to where I came from. Exactly. Right. a lot of people. <laughs> it sounds a lot similar to what just happened with Laban, didn't it? Doesn't it? Right? Didn't we just have this happen? A whole bunch of men chasing him again. <laughs> And we know Jacob's response in verse 7. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies. For he said to himself, obviously, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the company which is left will escape. So not a bad plan, <laughs> but he's he's doing what in his fear? He's assuming the worst, isn't he? Well, when he left, didn't Esau right. threaten him? And that was the last thing Esau said to him. Yes, and we I know the it's Jewish belief that Esau also sent people to ambush him after he left. Right? Um, I don't know if that's true, but it certainly adds interest to the story. Um, so, yeah, he's afraid. He's definitely afraid. Uh, whatever Esau's intentions are, we don't have any sense of that from Scripture so far. All we know is that Jacob is afraid, and he's got this big company of people, and he already left. You know, we know all that. And he's. He, you know, is supposed to be doing the right thing here, but he's overcome with his fear. Any other comment or question on that? 
When you take your eyes off Jesus, you go underwater. Mm. Well, we've had a couple interactions here with Jacob. We had the Bethel moment. We had the moment where God talks to him to leave. We had this little thing with the angels. And then here we have in verse 9... Um, 9 to 12 a very heartfelt prayer that we have that we just we haven't had from him at all um, a very heartfelt prayer it's beautiful I started if you are looking at the thing I did because I thought this is this is this is a foxhole prayer right um, he says verse 9 Jacob said O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your relatives and I'll prosper you. I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and of all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. For with my staff only I crossed this Jordan, and now I've become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he will come and attack me and the mothers of the children. For you said, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. So what do you think about that prayer? I think he's trying to remind God of the promise. <laughs> yeah. You know, you said. That's an interesting point, Henry. But I want us to be clear. That that didn't happen to Jacob. When did God say to Jacob, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. He didn't say that to Jacob, did he? Not yet. He didn't. He said it to Abraham. He did say it to Abraham. He said it to Abraham in chapter 13. He said something similar to it. He didn't say the sand yeah. or the sea. He said something else. Similar. Yeah. In chapter th Now, I'm sorry to take us back here, but this is so interesting. that So Jacob is claiming the promise of Abraham. And other than trying to steal a blessing... This is the first time that Jacob has been so moved about this because that promise of the children and that blessing at first happened when Abraham separated from Lot in chapter 13. That was a lot of weeks ago. Remember, Lot moves away and you sort of feel like we talked about Abraham must have been upset, right? Like they're, and this was a promise that time that God, God said, don't worry. Um, Look to the east, to the west, to the north, to the south. All of this will be yours, and you will not be able to count just like this way. The other time, and I think this is also significant, and I'm sorry to, um, to say it again, but it's in Genesis 22. Again, with the possible separation of family, in that moment up on the mountain with Abraham and Isaac, when Abraham... When God says to Abraham, I can see now that you have not even withheld your own son. That's the other time that that kind of wording happens. Right? And we presume that those stories are told along to Isaac and then told along to Jacob. But Jacob is claiming that same promise. And the context of those being destruction. Right? Right? A death of a family member, right? That was Isaac and separation from that and acceptance of God's promise. This is a really loaded part right here. It's a loaded part in the they gym, agree, too. They agree. <laughs> they agree. <laughs> They're like your own cheering section. And unlike a... Unlike some of the Psalms, which are like, deliver me from the hands of my enemies, break their, you know, shields and their spears, show them, you know, shoot them with the fiery darts from you or whatever. Um, 
he says why he's afraid of Esau. I, he says, I fear him. Um, I fear that he's going to come attack my children and the mothers. There's something very heartfelt about this prayer that is slightly different than other foxhole prayers that we, we know we're going to keep reading about in Scripture, right? And it's funny that he would choose that wording or that part of the covenant and promise to mention at the end of this prayer. That one specifically, right? I mean, we could take it completely literally like, oh, you said I'd have a lot of kids, so make sure none of my mothers and kids get killed because <laughs> I'm afraid of Esau. It could be totally literal, and I'm completely fine with that interpretation. But I, I really believe that it's Jacob really drawing a line here with who he is as a person of God's chosen promise. It's, I just feel like it's more. It's more than just saying, oh yeah, well, I got a lot of kids. You said we'd have a lot of kids. I, it just feels deeper than that. Ooh. It gives me chills a little bit. That's a, that's, that's a really... Oof. Sorry, I did all the talking there. Anybody else got a comment or question on that? What about verse 10? What do you think of that? Seems uh, guilty. Seems very uh, sort of self-deprecating. Well, you know, we didn't see in any of the commentaries on... Uh, Remember him telling his wives and complaining about Laban, he's changed my wages ten times. Um, right? <laughs> right? We don't see any of that tone here talking to God. We only see a thankfulness for Laban. And I consider the amount of fear that Jacob had for his brother. All right? We have to consider, too, not only was Jacob living with Laban, he was also living under Laban's protection. We need to consider that, right? Suddenly, he, he, Laban and him got kind of stinky, and he leaves Laban, and suddenly he has lost also the safety of that. And then he's confronted with the other drama of his past, right? And suddenly, looking back then on his experience, he's not like, well, Lord, you know how hard I worked for Laban. And, man, I deserve all these flocks and herds I got now, right? And then, no, we don't have any hints of that in this prayer. It's really different. Oof. It also in 10 is, is, I think, saying I didn't bring any weapons to defend myself. All I got was my staff. You know, and he's kind of pleading to God that I, I can't defeat Esau with my staff. And I think he's also commenting on, on how much has happened in 20 years. And he only came over with the staff before, and now he's got all these children and wives and, and donkeys. Oh, my. That was like lions and tigers and bears. Oh, God! <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Let's go on to the verse 13. So he spent the night there. Then he selected from what he had with him a present for his brother Esau. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milking camels and their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys, and a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> <laughs> I just added that just to make sure everybody's listening. <laughs> yeah. Now you have to do all the actions. All right. <laughs> all right. 200 female goats. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I see the replay on that. No, I don't want to see a replay on that. <laughs> Nobody turned that into a uh, TikTok or whatever. <laughs> um, 30 milking camels. Uh, and their colts. Okay. 40 cows. And no, I gotta stop. I gotta stop. 
Um, so he got as a big, pretty big present, right? Big present. Verse 16. How dare you go ahead? <laughs> he delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by itself. And he said to his servants, Pass on before me and put a space between the droves. Now that is proper social distancing. Good job. <laughs> Good job, Jacob. <laughs> a space between the droves. Right. Um, that's. We know we learn about. Servants got killed. <laughs> Jacob can hide Caleb out of town. I'm gonna guess that he didn't tell his servants like, "Hey, uh, uh, <laughs> hey, by the way, Esau has a vendetta against me." Right. <laughs> also, Esau. And here's the other thing: the servants didn't say, "Oh, and Esau's planning on killing you." Also, Esau didn't hurt the servants. Right? So, Jacob is really, he's really afraid, but in a sense, we have no sense looking at the story with the information provided, other than the history, to assume there's really going to be trouble. Other than the 400 men, because I think that's just, I think you can be afraid about that, right? Um, in verse 17, he commanded the one in front, this is the servants, remember, saying, When my brother Esau meets you and asks you, saying, To whom do you belong and where are you going? And to whom do these animals in front of you belong? Then you shall say, These belong to your servant Jacob. It's a present sent to my lord Esau. And behold, he also is behind us. <coughs> then he commanded also the second and the third and all those who followed the droves, saying, After this banner you shall speak to Esau when you find him, and you shall say, Behold, your servant Jacob also is behind us. For he said... Again, I think to himself, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. Then afterward, I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. I underline that because the connection with what's happening with the Lord here and with Esau is too similar to ignore. He has a history He's trying to make some right with some gifts. And he's going to see him face to face. And he's wondering if he will be accepted. Right. And he tells all of his, his servants to say, your servant, Jacob. Yes. So he's humbling himself. And Jacob has always been kind of, um, you know, the high and mighty or thought he, you know, thought he was all that and a cup of tea and now uh, he's humbling himself and repenting for his past um, way he treated his brother and in that nature of repentance in verse 20 his repentance is also seeking acceptance forgiveness yeah. seeking okay. forgiveness yeah it's, it's really quite beautiful. It is. Well, that's a lot of droves. <laughs> so, so you get it, like he told each servant in charge of the drove, you go first, and then to the other one afterward. You take yours then, and that's, well, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's uh, the goats, the male goats, they're probably separate, the ewes, the rams, the cows, the colts, 40, I mean, so we got at least, at least five to a dozen droves. So, that's a lot. That's a big gift. Um, Hope he has a big ranch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other comments or questions on that part? We're at, otherwise, we're at verse 21. Okay. So, the present passed on before him. Of course, that means the droves of animals. While he himself spent that night in the camp. Now he rose that same night and took his two wives and his two maids and his eleven children and crossed the floor of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and he sent across whatever he had. And that's that's through verse 23. Um it's so notice. He moved his kids and a bunch of his other stuff in the middle of the night, 
right? Why would you cross, cross a river in the middle of the night? I mean, it's a ford, so it's probably not like a raging river. It's probably really easier to cross, but why would he do that in the middle of the night? That almost makes no sense. Was it a strategic move for... Was it, a, I don't know, for maybe Esau's impending attack? Uh, maybe. I'm more inclined to believe that he woke up and just could not sleep because he was so freaked out. And he said, I, I gotta get things moving. I'll get, <laughs> hey everybody, wake up. You're all, going, we're all going across, right? Um, and he's, re I interpret it as his restlessness and fear yeah. caused him to make them all move. And then he went behind um, to stay back. Like he was still sorting it out himself. He needed some alone time. Maybe all those four wives were driving him crazy. <laughs> right? You also kind of wonder if he was afraid. Did he send them across so that Esau would run into them first? And well, maybe that would soften his heart? Sure, when he saw all the kids and stuff. Well, and it almost makes you think perhaps that this was the Lord's, I mean, it doesn't say it, but maybe this was also the Lord's prompting in him to send them. And then he's alone, and now God has his attention, and this is when the wrestling happens. When you're alone, you know, when you've got people around you, you're too busy worrying about your wives and all the things, and he's alone, and that's when the wrestling I definitely would support that view, Major Shannon. I hope everybody heard it online, too. Mostly because, too, uh, as he's getting ready to be alone, suddenly we see a very, like Rebbe has said, a very repentant heart. Suddenly we see a very accepting heart. Suddenly this is the first time we've had language that indicates that the blessing that he received, that he plans on living in that blessing, it's... The first that we see that living in the covenant uh, of his children, of God's covenant, is going to be a part of his life, right? Really, other than just having kids, which we know is not really exactly what the covenant's all about, right? We know it's more than that. And if Jacob is only now ready to realize that, God has an open platform to wrestle with him, doesn't he? If Jacob is wrestling with God which I know is going to happen next, um, it's maybe more spiritual and physical here, right? Uh, it's both, both reality and a metaphor. And that's the context that, that in verse 24, and if we didn't know, Major Sh like Major Shannon said, then Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Comes across just like the beginning of the chapter, right? Oh, and uh, he saw some angels of the Lord, right? <laughs> uh, this man wrestled with him until daybreak. Verse 25, when he saw, and you can see it in my writings, sometimes there's a lot of he's in here, so the, the red ones... Our God, the blue ones are Jacob, if you're looking along. Sorry, people online. Just because it's easy to get them mixed up on which he is, which he is talking. Um, when he, meaning God, saw, uh, or the angel or whatever, that he had not prevailed against him, Jacob, the man touched the socket of Jacob's thigh. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with this guy. Then the man said, um, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And I think we have to pause there and consider the nature of that wrestling match, right? It sort of reminds me of... It sort of reminds me of like Native American traditions of like fighting, fighting to receive like uh, um, 
some sort of like uh, commendation that you have fought well, you know. Um, it, it lacks, I don't think we should read this with the American, they got in a fight and one guy won. You know, that's sort of like the American way of viewing this. But I do not believe that's the way it's written at all. And I don't think this is saying like, oh yeah, the other guy was a chump wrestler. Right? The, I don't think that's the point either. <laughs> Darren, I know you wanted to say that. You're like, oh, uh, no, God. No, I was going to say it reminds me of Hulk Hogan versus Andre the Giant, but I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, what do you think about that wrestling match? I'm super interested to see if anyone has any thoughts about that. I find it just such an interesting thing to think that He's wrestling with God, um, and God is so powerful that there's more to it than just a wrestling match. I think it's uh, something that if I was like in like Sunday school and somebody like another child said, "Hey, did you know that somewhere in the Bible they have a wrestling match?" I'd be like, "You make that up." <laughs> <laughs> because there's this, there's like uh, more than one level to it, which the first level would be like, obviously it just seems like there's the physical uh, implications of sort of wrestling, but then also it's sort of like, it's almost like it's pretty relatable in a sense, like sometimes that's, that's what we do. I think everyone at some point has that experience where they feel like they want to like they want to they're fighting God. They're not working with him. They're working against him. And when you're working against him, you know it's it just it's it's really self defeating. But it's something that sometimes can be beneficial in the sense that not that it was a good idea, but that you can realize why it wasn't a good idea. And so for some people, it's not until they get into that where they're like, oh, I get it now. Similar to how some people, when they get into drugs, they don't really stop until they hit rock bottom, until they there's some sort of conflict there. Hmm. Well, I think we can all recognize, too, um, that God speaks to us all a little differently. Remember when we talked about Abraham and the covenant and the the tearing of the animals and him walking through the middle, right? Um, and I hit pretty hard that God didn't need that. Like, that that wasn't really for God's sake. That was for Abraham's sake. Um, and as I look at this story of Jacob, where Jacob is, I think I'm defending slightly, like, really claiming this promise of Abraham, we see God here in an interaction with Jacob that is uh, akin to what Major Shannon said. Like he's alone to for like have this like spiritual like wrestling with God and his fears and going back and uh, what about my kids and what God and his heartfelt prayer. We have a physical manifestation and a, a physical wrestling match that mirrors what was already happening to him emotionally. Um, and I have to say, to me. I see this as something that Jacob needed for him to sort it out, right? I don't think God really needed to come down and have a wrestling match. And I sort of feel like uh, if, right, God, God could just touch his hip and then like, ooh, well, I, I won, right? <laughs> and that's literally what happened, right? <laughs> so it wasn't about the, that part. Um, it was something deeper. Um, and then the rest of the story here, I think, is we see where Jacob starts to put the pieces together uh, and maybe knew all along who this person really was, right? Well, yeah, I think so. Did you read through verse 27? What verse do we stop at? We did. Do you want to start from 27 and read a few verses till you feel like we should stop and talk? Um, so, Major? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, Excuse me. Before she does that, um, I had a I had a thought um, came from left field, but you know Jacob's struggles with God 
was a lot like Jesus' struggle in the garden. Hmm. Where Jesus knew what he needed to do, but he was scared. The human part of Jesus was like, if you can take this cup from me, if there's any other way, otherwise your will, not mine, be done. I think that was a, a physical, emotional, spiritual struggle that Jacob had, just kind of like the one that Jesus had, and they there's comparisons there that are similar. That, you could be right, Rebbe. It's certainly relatable. I think it's very relatable to us all to see when he was in a bad place, um, and that, that desperate cry from the garden echoes that sort of desperate prayer that he had said before. And this desperate wrestling match, right? That's right. And Shannon, did you want to read a couple verses? Did you leave off on 26? Yes, 27 okay, well, is this 27, I think, really lends itself to your question, which is, did he really know who he was wrestling against? So, verse 27, so he said to him, and I think he is the man he's wrestling with, said to him, Jacob, what is your name, obviously, and he said, oh, so, t sorry, 26 is where it says that I think he knows who he's wrestling with, because he says, I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. He's talk that's Jacob talking to the man, right? And that's Major Shannon's commentary that that means... He knows. That he knows who it is. He knows who it is. Yeah. Okay. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and men and have prevailed. Okay. So in verse 28, when God said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Is that a commentary on their wrestling match? Or is it a commentary on Jacob's own walk with God? I think it's that he and God have been on opposite ends for a long time. And now finally, Jacob is willing to do what God wants. Mm -hmm. You guys ever do that game where you have the, the, the dots and you have to connect the dots, right? By the, by the numbers. Oh, connect the dots. Right. Yeah, connect the dots, that's right. I feel like uh, verse 28, when he says to him, you've striven with God and with men and you've prevailed, I feel like, Henry, it's, it's God connecting the dots with Jacob. Um, a little bit of that's right. I'm God. You've been you've been striving against me not just tonight, not just all night, right? Um, it's also a recognition of his surrender in that moment too. You know, he's he's finally given up. Like that's that's the moment. But like Paul, I I often take this. Paul says that he's working out his salvation with fear, fear and trembling. It sort of reminds me of the same thing. Like, it's okay that we work through our relationship with the Lord. Like, it also reminds me that everyone's relationship with the Lord isn't super easy. You know, it isn't always easy just to trust God. Sometimes we do fight with Him because we don't understand. And, and for some of us, it takes like a little, just like some time for us to get it. And some of us, it takes not a literal battle, but it really takes a battle within us of like the surrender. And, and sometimes surrender is super easy and sometimes it's super hard. And to me, this is just another reminder that following the Lord isn't always just a piece of cake. Sometimes it it takes time, but it also shows that in the surrender there was a blessing for him. I hope everybody heard you online. You're really far away from the 
thing today. Um, the major Shannon was talking about that this reminds her of surrender. Um, well, they heard me. I'm a big girl. Uh, <laughs> good. Don't uh, laugh, Kiara. <laughs> <laughs> Let the records show that Major Shannon said she has a big mouth. No. Um, I love that image of surrender, and I think that definitely fits completely. Verse 29, uh, then Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. And then this interesting thing, but he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. It, so this is different than, um, I am the God, I, I am, tell them I am, that we know. We haven't gotten to Moses yet. Right, we haven't gotten to Moses. Um, and it's, it's just a real interesting thing. Uh, God, God, to me, God's saying, you should know who I am. Yeah. Right? Jacob, you have anything to say? I saw you're thinking about it. I see your wheels turning. Jacob thinks, not Jacob in the story. Not Jacob in the story. Mm -hmm. Jacob, Jacob yeah. thinks behind the camera. It's interesting how it's kind of playing fast and loose with the term man and God here. Um, mm -hmm. So in verse 24, is definite that he is wrestling with a man. A man wrestled with him for liberates. But he's striven with God and prevailed. In 28. Um, and then in 30, he says, I have seen God face to face. You know, I like to learn through the earth. It's just interesting to think about that. That's interesting. And it's mysterious. It's mysterious. Ah, well, we haven't gotten to that verse yet, but I see what you were doing there. Um, Jacob brings up a good point, too. Um, is this a personification of, is this an angel, is this an angel of God? Is this God himself in some human form? Uh, does it matter? Um, probably not, right? It, that, that is the hallmark of this story. Um, and Jacob said, that Jacob said, and he read in verse 30, so Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Why do you think that is special? Because in the Bible it says that anyone who looked upon the face of God immediately became destruction. They just, like, died. And which is why in the temple, sometimes they would have people go into the temple attached with ropes so that if they died, they could just pull the body out. Go ahead, that's alright. This is a, definitely a read into things sort of okay. section of scripture. Alright. But this is written, we presume, by Moses. So this story has just been said down the line by word of mouth until we get to Moses. So by the time we get to Moses, Aaron is right, we already have known. God only, God only shows his face. Well, God doesn't, I mean, Moses is up on the mountain, and when he's up on the mountain with the Lord, his hair turns white, right? Right. I mean, like, you know. And his whole face his shines. His whole face shines. He has to wear a veil. The of the Lord, he has to wear a veil. Right. So, I don't know, maybe this is like just another reminder that being in the presence of the Lord is, is a special, life-changing moment. And for Moses, it was the white hair, or have to wear a veil because I'm shining with Shekinah glory moment. With Jacob, it was just this, he wrestled with the Lord and the Lord preserved his life. Like just this awe and reverence for the Lord. Is that why he gets to name it, the place? Because I'm honestly pretty jealous that this was so early in human history that just got to name the place after they did a specific thing there. Pretty cool. I wish I could have been there and like gotten to name places after something happened. <laughs> what about to name all the animals? 
All right. Well, I definitely love that idea of meeting meeting with God face to face. If Jacob's really, I'm not trying to. Okay, I am also overthinking this. I'll admit that. But as we look at a relationship with God, um, I think you can see in Jacob's life that it was all about his grandfather. It was all about his father. It was about promises of stuff. Um, and suddenly in here, we have a man who is seeking forgiveness, who is seeking acceptance, who is looking to resolve with his brother face to face. And yet in his striving against God, suddenly it's in a face to face that he is receiving acceptance truth from God himself if you will. As, a, as he is getting ready to face his fear face to face with Esau, he has this moment where he's, we already know he's overwhelmed with fear, that God meets with him face to face. The same guy, he had already made a pillar, he had had this dream, and I sort of feel like God has been like, I'm here, I'm here, right? Um, and then suddenly, Jacob really wrestles with him. And I, I have to say, receives that acceptance. Although he also gets a, a limp, right? The sun, <laughs> the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore, to this day, the sons of Israel did not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he, meaning this man, this, this personification, this theophany of God, touched the socket of Jacob's thigh, in the sinew of the head. And I have to think to myself, even if it didn't last forever, it was like dislocated and it like got popped in or whatever, I feel like that was always going to bother him like the rest of his life. Old Arthur. It was going to be right. Our arthritis would be bad there first, right, for other places. I feel like he was always going to have a reminder of that personal interaction with God. And think about it. At times where God has had a personal interaction with us, can we possibly forget those? I mean, it's pretty. It is pretty incredible. I mean, those moments should be. They should be unforgettable. But just even the memorial of what the, I don't need to say. Like his hip is out of place. Oh, and his right. And that's the memorial of him meeting with God. But um, you know that that it would be that life changing for us. And I'm certainly Lord. Not asking that you would put something out of place. I already have enough of that. Right. <laughs> Maybe that's why my shoulder. No, no. <laughs> um, but of course, that you know that impact of meeting with the Lord. And again, again, I I, I love the equating it to Paul's words about working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Um, you know that there's a real struggle there, and that's okay. And that it's okay that, there, that there's a struggle. You know, there's several parts of this are, are like a covenant, an exchange of name, a new name. Uh, and in the covenant, there was a scar, to, you know. And so instead of a scar, he's got a limpy hip. And it really is kind of a relationship, a covenant that he's making with God. I mean, it doesn't come right out and say that, but... Oh, no, Henry, I think you're wrong. I think it does come out right and say that. Oh, yeah. I think it just did, and you just noticed it and said yeah. it, too. Yeah. Uh, I, so you're wrong. I think you're wrong that you're right. <laughs> you're absolutely right. And if he made a covenant with Laban that was all about protection and stuff, then he just had that covenant confirmed with God um, in a real personal way. I think you nailed it on the head, Henry. This is covenant. Right. This is this whole story of Abraham that we've had before. This is the story of Noah. This is the story of creation. Uh, it's This is the same story here with Jacob. Yeah. So do Jews still not... I don't know, that's a 
good that's a good question. I don't know how you eat sinew. I mean I I, I don't even sinew. know what that means. <laughs> sinew is that really like can when you get ribs, yeah. that's like sort of stringy connective tissue. Uh, it's okay. not easy to chew at all. Okay. I don't I would, know. I wouldn't eat it from any part of it. Uh, we're going to close with a word of prayer, so that'll be Major Shannon. She got some prayer requests. We'll we put the camera closed so Good to can see everybody clear. tonight. Good to see you all tonight. Everybody's here. Good to see all of you online. Um, from our um, comments, um, Charlotte, thank you so much for always reminding us to to pray. And you are you are a warrior for. Um, your family um, who are struggling with this virus and those at Harmony House. So thank you. Um, so I, again, um, am reminded we're praying for Harmony House, for all those who are struggling with the virus. We think of Harold. And if you don't mind, Rebby, would that was that an update? Or can I just say what you said to me in the car? You can say that. Okay. So Rebby has given an update that Harold is... Harold's oxygen is normal, mm -hmm. and so that is a praise, and he even sat up today, um, so we praise God for that. So he's getting stronger, and it looks like his, his breathing is getting better, so that is all really good news. That's wonderful. Um, so we're continuing to pray for Harold. We're praying for Deborah, who is... Um, of course, everybody knows back in Waterloo at Allen Hospital, and so we're continuing to pray for her. She, well, no, it was Ralph who joined us for worship on Sunday, so um, we certainly miss Ralph and Deborah. So continuing to pray for both of them. Ralph still in the hospital. I, I actually haven't heard. I sent. Him, I didn't call him, but I sent him a text. I haven't heard back. I was okay. Saying, he was supposed to go to rehab, but I haven't followed up to find out if okay. he has or not. Okay. Keep praying for all of them. And um, a friend of mine also has an unspoken prayer request, if we could pray for that. And then um, we also ask those who visit our lunch program and have lunch with us um, to, to sign in if they have any prayer requests. So I have a few. So if we could pray for Rico and for provision for a home and for um, this person's mom who is needing some medication and also to pray for good education. Um, this person asks us to pray for world peace and for the election and another um, prayer request for world peace. So um, certainly on, on people's hearts that we pray for world peace. Erin, yeah. um, how are your parents doing? I have an update on my parents. Good, we would love to hear that. Uh, a while ago I said that they tested positive for COVID they, uh, so they were doing fine, and they still are fine, and they, um, they recently got tested again, and they have, have now have permission to go back to work. Yay. Also, I don't know how many people I told, but um, my mother got hip surgery. She got her entire hip replaced, uh, her right hip, or her left hip, I don't know which one. Um, but she, uh, she's been recovering, and I don't think she even needs to use a cane anymore. Oh, that's she's so great. She's so excited, feels better than Wow. She's not in a lot of pain. Praise God. So now she can actually walk a decent amount. Absolutely. So, yay that your dad, no doubt, is ready to go back to to ministry and that your she's, mom... She's ready. She just doesn't want to. Yeah, for sure. And your mom, we praise God for the, the hip surgery did its part. It just took a little while to recover, which is understandable. Good yeah. job. Anybody else have anything, Darren? Um, a good friend of ours that we used to go to church with in Calvary Baptist, that we still talk to on sure. the regular. Sure. One of her fiancés just recently had a baby, and I guess um, her fiancé got in a, or her husband, I should say, not her fiancé, got in a wreck, oh. a real bad wreck. And it sent absolute, it was so bad it had to send him to Iowa City. Oh gosh. And I guess it was just right outside their house. So, wow. Like being fair to say how safe recovery and all. You know, Absolutely. The guy's name is Ryan, Ryan Letterman. Ryan, okay. And uh, his, his, his wife's name is Sarah Letterman. And I 
guess the baby and you know younger son was in the car when it happened. So let's pray that the, your baby can get in with Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. We definitely will pray for Ryan and Sarah and their children. Kiara, can we share your good news too about yeah. uh, about the house? Mm -hmm. The house is sold. You're kidding! Yesterday. So uh -huh. fast! Mm -hmm. Wow! They just looked at a house today again. It's by another school, School Student Hall. Um, they're talking about it, so hopefully we get that. And we're going to try to move like for school. Wow. Okay, we will pray for the perfect new home for you guys. And moving uh, protection. <laughs> right, for sure. We, know we have a lot goes. of makeup and candles, so hopefully those will work. <laughs> the safety of the makeup and candles. Yeah. I love it. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Anybody else? Good. All right. Well, let's pray together. Father God, we, we love you, and we are grateful to be together tonight. We're grateful for your word, Lord, and how it speaks to us. And... Um, you, of course, Lord, we are, we are reminded that your word is living and active, and we want to apply what we have read to our hearts and to our minds. And so um, we think today, uh, just Lord, how patient and kind you are with us. Sometimes it takes a while for us to surrender to your will, and sometimes we wrestle, Lord, internally even with you, God, um, we wrestle in, in our hearts about surrendering and trusting you. And we thank you, Lord, that you are very patient with us. And um, we, we maybe don't deserve that, Lord. That is your grace and your mercy extended to us. So um, we just pray that we would trust you more and that our faith would continue to grow. We think today, Lord, of those in Harmony House, um, the employees and the residents, Lord, protect them, could place your hand upon them, Lord. We continue to pray for Harold and uh, just ask that you would, Lord, continue to strengthen him. We pray for Deborah and Ralph. Rebbie and I were just talking. It'd be so great if the three of them could just meet up and chit chat for a moment and encourage each other. Um, but we know, Lord, that that's not um, what's allowed at the hospital right now. But we just pray that you'd be with each of them and, and protect them and continue, Lord, to place your hand upon their body. I pray for my friend, Lord, who needs prayer today. Just be near to her. We thank you, God, that the O'Neills are doing better, that um, Major Jerry and Major Vanji have recovered from, from their uh, time with COVID, Lord. And we praise you, God that Major Vanji is feeling better after her hip surgery, Lord. We, we praise you for that. We know how precious they are to, to this core and how precious they are to us. We pray for Ryan and Sarah and their children, that you would be with them as, um, Lord, they are experiencing recovery from that car accident that can have a lot of impacts on, on um, people who've experienced that. So just be near to them. And we trust and pray, Lord, that you would be with Kiara and um, her family's new home as they are looking for a new place. And we just praise you, God, for the answer to prayer that their home sold so quickly. Um, Lord, we also pray for the things that people have asked us to pray for. We think of Rico. And uh, we pray, Lord, for the other family who needs a provision for a home and for medication and for education, Lord. We pray for world peace and, of course, on all of our hearts, Lord, is the election that is coming up, and, and we just trust you, Lord, for that. We pray that you would give wisdom, Lord. Um, we love you, and we are grateful, God, for our time together. Continue to be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you all. God bless you all. Have a great night. Stay safe. Stay healthy.